Hey friends, welcome back. So today we're going to take a deeper dive into vitamin D and your fat tissue and specifically hone in on fat cell metabolism, fat cell regulation, the inflammation that is commonly characterized by being overweight or obese in terms of the fat tissue being inflamed. We're going to dive into this. Again, I I come across these papers and when I learn something from them, I think, gosh, I got to break it down and share this with you. There is some technical jargon, but the take home message here is vitamin D is sequestered in fat tissue. Vitamin D influences the metabolism, the release of different so-called adipocytokines like leptin and adiponectin and visfatin and resistin. We're going to talk about those shortly. But the main point here is if individuals like yourself are overweight or obese, you might need to increase the levels of vitamin D that you take. And there's some studies that we're going to dive into showing that obese, overweight individuals have, are more prone to having a vitamin D insufficiency. And that vitamin D insufficiency causes a dysregulation within the fat cells themselves that contribute to metabolic disease and chronic inflammation. So I think it's really important that we take a pause. We just review vitamin D metabolism. We talk about where you get vitamin D from both dietary supplements, different foods like mushrooms, fatty fish, dairy, uh, and, and the metabolism, and talk about testing, and then talk about why this is so important and a particularly timely you know, during the winter months, as we record this, you know, in early February now, uh, if you live, you know, north of Atlanta, Georgia, even if you're getting, you know, sun like it is, you might be able to see it. Sun is coming through the window, believe it or not, here in Seattle uh, in, in late January. But the zenith angle of the sun is insufficient to induce vitamin D cutaneous synthesis. So we need to focus on getting it from either foods, mushrooms, uh, or, or traveling, or taking dietary supplements. Okay. So with that as a a long-winded introduction, let's dive into the details. The title of this 35-page paper, it's free on the internet. Highly recommend that you check it out. I will link it in the show notes below. The title is The Action of Vitamin D in Adipose Tissue. Let's pause. Adipose is fat tissue, okay? So visceral fat, brown adipose tissue, subcutaneous fat, that's all in the bucket of adipose tissue. Is there a link between vitamin D deficiency and adipose tissue-related metabolic disorders? All right. So it turns out there is a link here, and they they talk a a lot in the abstract. We're going to break it down. They say the molecular responses to vitamin D and adipose tissue affects not only energy metabolism and adipokine and anti-inflammatory cytokines, but also it affects the adipocyte differentiation. So that is, how many fat cells are you making? Uh, They talk about apoptosis. Now, when you get overweight or obese, your fat cells actually become necrotic and they can die. And it turns out that calcium signaling is intimately involved in fat cell apoptosis. And we know that you're like, wait, calcium and vitamin D, they go hand in hand. So there's a connection here with vitamin D insufficiency and aberrant calcium signaling and fat cell death and necrosis and apoptosis. So there's a lot of functional importance uh, linked with vitamin D metabolism and your fat. But let's dive into the nitty gritty details. We'll talk about the different isoforms of vitamin D, the different subtypes, D2, D3, D4, D5, and where we get it. Okay. So just again, a little bit more introduction. The literature and data indicate that the active form of vitamin D is produced, stored, and degraded in adipose tissue. Both the vitamin D receptor and the active vitamin D metabolite, we're going to talk about it calcitriol or 125 dihydroxy vitamin D are expressed in adipocytes, which are your fat cells, allowing vitamin D to exert genomic and non-genomic responses in fat cells. Okay. We're talking about influencing leptin, influencing adiponectin signaling, affecting the level of the inflammatory environment within the fat cells, also impacting the release or lipolysis of fat. So let's just pause and, and just link it back to practical take home here. You're in your 40s. You gained some weight during the last two years because of the pandemic and gym closures. You're trying to lose weight and you're eating low calorie diet, maybe low carb. You're exercising, but things aren't going the right direction and you haven't yet considered taking vitamin D. You're like, well, this could be a situation where you can actually benefit by increasing your vitamin D levels. And we'll talk about solutions and testing in just a moment. But because the data goes on to show, vitamin D exerts its effects on the uh, adipogenesis or the formation of fat cells. Now, let's, let's pause about the significance of adipogenesis. That is the formation of new fat cells. When you take an individual who's lean and they start to get overweight and obese and morbidly obese, the degree of adipogenesis is not nominal. It's very significant. We're talking about billions of new fat cells for every 10 pounds of body weight gain. 
So this is a very significant process that is occurring. And having sufficient levels of vitamin D has been shown, at least in animal models and different cellular studies that we're going to review here in a moment, have been shown to in slowly inhibit that level of adipogenesis. So again, we don't have the large randomized placebo-controlled studies in, in humans, in adults, particularly in children, to show that vitamin D can actually block that. But the levels of the active metabolites of vitamin D have been shown to suppress this degree of adipogenesis or the formation of new fat cells. So again, this should be something that we all should be considering. And I'll just say clinically, you know, working in a clinic with Gerard Guillory and then working, having my own clients for the past 10 years, uh, I have found in my overweight clients repeatedly since 2006, vitamin D insufficiency as noted on their 25 hydroxy vitamin D blood levels. So uh, very important stuff that I think we, we should all be focusing on. Now, before we continue on with all the details, let's focus on the vitamin D subtypes or the analogs that I mentioned. Okay, so you have ergocalciferol, vitamin D2. Okay, so this is found, actually the prescription vitamin D that you might get from a mainstream doctor is generally D2, which I think it's now widely recognized that vitamin D2 is not really as optimal as vitamin D3 in terms of a supplement or intervention. Um, although you do get vitamin D2 or er ergocalciferol from mushrooms, I generally recommend eating mushrooms if they agree with you. There's a lot of immunologic properties. They're low in carbs. I think they're satiating. They're really good. And plus, you know, some people, believe it or not, they actually buy their mushrooms or forage their mushrooms, put them out in the sun, and that can increase the vitamin D2 and vitamin D4 that's present in mushrooms. Now, I think that's a lot of work because vitamin D is very affordable. You can buy a bottle for 10 bucks a month, right? So if you have the time to go out and forage mushrooms and put them in the sun and then take them, okay, you might be getting more vitamin D as well. But most of the vitamin D that we get from food and that you actually get when you go out in the sun is vitamin D3, which is known as cholecalciferol. So fatty fish, we're talking dairy, ruminants, in the flesh or the skin of animals as well. So vertebrate animals in their skin will contain vitamin D3 known as cholecalciferol. So also egg yolks, that's another uh, important source of that. And then dietary supplements, okay? So when people say, oh my gosh, you're getting lanolin. So vitamin D3, um, we're gonna talk about supplements in just a moment. Um, how, for example, you know, the one of our sponsors here, Myoscience, how Myoscience gets the vitamin D3 is from irradiating sheep wool, and that's called lanolin. So that basically you're, you're taking a UVB radiation to sheep's wool and that creates the vitamin D and then it's extracted. People say, well, that's synthetic. Okay, it's still coming from, I mean, this is what would happen to a sheep that was roaming the countryside during the summertime, okay? So I think there's this, this idea that if something is produced via help from industry that it's not the same molecule. Cholecalciferol is cholecalciferol. So just recognize that as we continue on. There's also an analog known as vitamin D5, cetocalciferol, that's derived from an Ayurvedic herb known as Raulfia sarpentina. I have a hard time with that. I guess some people do take this. I've never taken Raulfia. I've heard good things about it. To be honest, I don't know much about uh, Ayurvedic medicine. So uh, very interesting stuff. But mushrooms, there's this interesting study here going back to vitamin D4 and D2, there's a, a paper here, photobiology and vitamin D synthesis in mushrooms and its bioavailability in humans. So similarly as human skin is, mushrooms are capable of producing uh, vitamin D via UVB uh, radiation and so forth. And there's some people that literally forage mushrooms and put them out in the sun. Okay, Like I said, if you have a lot of time to do that, great. We're all busy in our lives. I would much rather just you know take a, take a supplement for the most part. Okay. So as we continue on with the metabolism, let's talk about what happens irrespective of the source of your vitamin D. Your liver is responsible for hydroxylating the pre-vitamin D into the somewhat active form known as calcidiol. So calcidiol is a, what you're actually measuring in your blood, which is 25 hydroxy vitamin D. So your liver does that hydroxylation. Then either your fat cells or your kidney will further hydroxylate it, and that's known as the 125 hydrox dihydroxy vitamin D. Okay, so this is known as calci calcitriol. Okay, so that's uh, there's two different forms. We're not going to focus on the names here. Just remember, 25 OH vitamin D is what you measure in your blood, and then the active form that is again double hydroxylated by either your fat cells or your kidney is um, the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, known as calcitriol. Okay. Here's an image that explains that very well so you understand what's going on here. And as it turns out, 
in the fat cells, particularly in overweight individuals, that double hydroxylation step that converts a vitamin D, the 25 OHD to the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D in the fat cells is down-regulated in obese and overweight people. Okay, so we need to understand that there could be issues there. Furthermore, in, in people who are diabetic, there's issues with kidney function. So there could be a suboptimal degree of activation of the 25 OH hydroxy to the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, which is the active form. Okay, so now that we have all that science, let's talk a little bit more about the fat cell in particular, leptin, adiponectin, and some takeaways for those of us who are trying to lose weight and optimize our body composition. But first, friends, I want to welcome you all back. Thank you for being here. It's Mike. If you're enjoying this content and you think your friends or family might enjoy it too, I would be so honored if you could share this video directly as a link with them or a podcast link just to encourage them to tune into this and check out these images and these show notes. Uh, also, if you have any questions, please leave a comment below. That helps the algorithm and please hit that like button. Also, we're talking about vitamin D here. There's a lot of practical and affordable solutions for you over at our sponsor, sister company, Myoscience Nutrition. So if you live in North America, as we just talked about, and you're north of Atlanta, Georgia, during the months of October and March, which is at the time you're probably watching this video or listening in iTunes, guess what? Even if you get a little walk, you're out in nature, you're getting insufficient levels of cutaneous vitamin D synthesis. So if you're not eating a lot of dairy or mushrooms or fatty fish, you should be supplementing. Now you might wonder, well, do I have a deficiency? And that's why we're offering an at-home vitamin D blood spot test through Omega Quant over on our website, myoscience.com. You can check this out. It's affordable. If you use the coupon code podcast at checkout, you can save. If you want to crank your levels up, there's a range of solutions that we offer at, at Myoscience, from a gummy, from liquids, to high-potency soft gels, to combination formulas paired with vitamin K2 in its MK7 form. So you can, again, use the coupon code podcast over at Myoscience to save. That's M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com, myoscience.com to save on all those solutions and testing options. Okay, so the big thing that we need to remember is vitamin D activates the vitamin D receptor. So this is what makes this vitamin particularly different from all the other vitamins that you think about. Folate, you know, you have thiamine, you have vitamin B12, you have riboflavin. Okay, generally those vitamins are cofactors in intermediary metabolic reactions. So processing carbohydrates or the, the you know, carbon uh, cycle, the one carbon metabolism methylation cycle, right? Generally, vitamins are cofactors, but vitamin D and vitamin A are different in that they activate the vitamin D receptor. This receptor is found in your fat tissue, found in your kidneys, found in your muscle, found in your bone. When it's activated, it affects your immune system. It affects calcium homeostasis and binding. It affects a lot of different inflammatory pathways. So that's why it's relevant to the fat cell conversation. It turns out that the VDR, the vitamin D receptor, also impacts lipolysis or the degree to which your fat cells release stored lipids or energy. Really important stuff. So I think this image does a great job. So there's genetic actions or genomic actions and genomic independent actions or effects from vitamin D. Okay, let's get to the nuts and bolts of it. So here's a very interesting stat. So our fat tissue stores between 35 and 75% of our total body levels of vitamin D, which I think is very important. And it's important to recognize this other related factor is our fat tissue undergo this constant rebuilding. And there's a lot of flux where fat cells are releasing stored energy and then rebuilding and, and, and regaining that lipolysis, lipogenesis cycle should be occurring on a healthy level. But in people who are overweight obese or who have type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance, there's not that same degree of this churn so it, it turns out that potentially some of this vitamin D could get sequestered within the fat cell and not be released to the rest of the body. So I think that's a very important thing to understand. And as this paper cites here, vitamin D deficiency is found to be 35 to 40% higher in overweight or obese individuals and also in diabetics compared to lean, healthy individuals. Okay, so let's finish off now with, I think, what is the most important aspect of this whole conversation is how vitamin D impacts this physiologic process that I just alluded to earlier called adipogenesis. So if we break that down, adipo would mean fat, genesis, creating from anew. So creating fat cells from anew. It turns out that vitamin D impacts so many different functions within the fat cell. As I mentioned, if you're gaining, if you're in a phase where you're gaining weight in life, going through menopause, you know, you've been working a lot, you know, burning the candle at both ends, not sleeping well, the, the pandemic, the whole thing. Well, uh, it turns out that vitamin D could impact, potentially augment uh, the degree of adipogenesis that is occurring. 
So here's an image here showing the undifferentiated stem cells and how they get converted into these new fat cells. And again, this process is just really, really turned on. Okay, so how does vitamin D affect that? Well, most studies have shown that lipid accumulation decreases with increasing calcitriol dosages. So remember, calcitriol is the 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. It's not what you're measuring on your blood test commonly, but you can measure. Uh, and so uh, calcitriol reduces the level of lipid accumulation uh, by down-regulating these different sterile regulatory binding proteins. So really interesting interconnections there. Okay, now... There's also another aspect of the dysregulated fat cell that we've talked about before. Mainstream medicine doesn't really address this too much, but it's the fat cell inflammation. And this is really mediated by leptin. High levels of leptin dysregulate the immune system and creates this inflammation that is characterized by being obese and overweight and diabetic. And there's a growing body of evidence that implicates vitamin D insufficiency as a factor contributing to this fat cell inflammation. Now, this is important because this inflammation that's derived from body fat worsens all sorts of metabolic parameters, insulin, uh, glucose homeostasis, cholesterol levels, triglycerides, and much more. And this is linked with fatty liver disease and all that. So vitamin D is intimately involved in affecting leptin and adiponectin secretion, which regulate this fat cell inflammation. So um, a direct quote, it was reported that vitamin D participates in both adipocytokine release and ener energetic homeostasis by controlling leptin production. So really important. Okay. They go on to say chronic activation of the immune system cells can trigger inflammation and obesity related pathogenesis um, in which insulin resistance is involved, as I mentioned there. And we know that with the whole pandemic, various individuals who have visceral adipose tissue are at greater risk for severe complications and, and, and the like, uh, greater risk of hospitalization and much more. Now, here's an important takeaway that you may want to remember. So there's this transcription factor known as NF-kappa B that sort of triggers all the inflammatory cascades within our cells. It turns out that vitamin D can inhibit this NF-kappa B activation. So that's just one of the many ways that vitamin D can impact the physiology of the immune system and the overactivation, the overexuberant immune response of the innate immune system, which is characterized by being obese, overweight, and having metabolic disease. So really important stuff there. Now, various studies have shown that overweight and obese individuals have a higher prevalence of vitamin D insufficiency. So that's been long known. And it could be due to all these different things that we've been talking about, from the metabolism, the uh, down regulation of the enzymes that create the active 125-dihydroxy vitamin D in the fat cells, the sequestration of vitamin D within the adipose tissue, and much more. So the take-home here is that if you're trying to lose weight or if you have metabolic-associated diseases, you should be testing for vitamin D. And possibly the dosing recommendations should have some sort of stratification based upon the degree of body fat one has. You know, This idea that everyone needs 4,000 you know, international units per day it should change based upon body fat uh, and health status and, and be titrated up potentially. Okay, uh, very interesting stuff here. I, I don't have a lot of details on this, but remember vitamin D impacts calcium metabolism. We know that calcium homeostasis or the balance of calcium affects apoptosis. Remember apoptosis is pre-programmed cell death. And in people who particularly have visceral adipose tissue and belly fat, there is a higher pre prevalence or preponderance of dead fat cells. I mean, it's kind of weird to think about the necrosis that occurs as you gain more and more weight. There's a, a dearth of blood vessels there to, to nourish those cells, so they end up dying. And that signals more and more inflammation and, and debris. Well, vitamin D insufficiency could be part of that pathological chain that goes on. So we need to consider that as well. Um, so I think that's really important. And there's a whole bunch of other images that we can finish off here. But Let's talk about what do we do, right? We're like, wow, okay. We know that vitamin D insufficiency is linked with the, the diseases that are characterized by the 21st century lifestyle, the obesity, the metabolic disease, insulin resistance. What can we do here? Well, obviously, just very simply, get our vitamin D levels up, okay? So for most people, that would mean taking between 4,000 international units up to 8,000. Um, I found, you know, clients that are taking north of 10,000 generally have vitamin D blood levels that are above the 59 to 60 nanograms per ml, which is sort of what is considered most protective during the winter months, okay? More is not always better because higher vitamin D levels will actually trigger a higher absorption of calcium. You can have too much calcium and you can have elevated um, 
calcium can be deposited in soft tissue and cause some challenges there. So optimize your vitamin D levels. But we also need to focus on exercise because exercise really helps to promote fat cell health and metabolism. So if we have inflamed fat cells and we're trying to you know help them not undergo all these pathologic changes that are linked with obesity and metabolic disease uh, and vitamin D insufficiency and the like, exercise can really help there because it can help to move and mobilize some of those stored lipids. So again, going back to that churn, I'll, I'll try to dig up the paper that really helped me understand that this churn and this turnover and this flux of fat cells is healthy. And unfortunately, what happens is when individuals become overweight, it's this, this flux or this churn becomes downregulated. And that is part of the problem uh, because you get these stagnated fat cells where they don't have this healthy churn or this flux. So this is where exercise and this is also where fasting can come in because of course, when you're fasting, what are you doing? You're dropping your glucose, dropping your insulin, raising your glucagon, and that creates this hormonal metabolic environment that fosters a healthier churn within your fat tissue. So I think it's important and we should also be considering the, the amount of vitamin D that people are taking uh, in relation to the amount of body fat they have as well. And particularly also if people have diabetes or if they have fatty liver disease, remember the first step of hydroxylation of the vitamin D that's made either from your diet or, or whatnot, um, skin and so forth if you're in the sun, is hydroxylated in the liver. And if you have fatty liver disease, NASH, um, you know, steatohepatitis, things like that, well, guess what? There, there could be a reduction in this hydroxylation step, okay? So really important stuff. I think this is just fascinating. I thought this paper did a great job, and they review a lot of these human clinical studies. I think we can go through, you know, some of these sort of quickly, uh, you know, just to, just to sort of talk about various randomized, parallel designed, placebo controlled studies have shown that when individuals are supplemented with vitamin D, there's reductions in fasting glucose, there's reductions in hemoglobin A1C, there's increases in triglycerides, uh, and much more. So what I will do is just link some of these tables here so you can see these, but essentially various intervention studies in humans, randomized placebo controlled studies have shown that vitamin D interventions can improve metabolic health. So I think that's really important, but just want to offer this disclaimer in these podcasts and videos, we're not diagnosing, treating, curing, or preventing disease. We're talking about supporting health. So uh, please check in with your doctor before you consider vitamin D as part of your uh, lifestyle intervention protocol. But I do want to thank these researchers. I want to thank you for tuning in. Hopefully you found this helpful and just got your mind thinking about other things that you can do. When people think about weight loss, they think about dieting, they think about detoxes, they think about thermogenic aids and so forth. You know, oftentimes vitamin D doesn't really come to mind, but there is mounting research and a lot of human interventional studies that shows that vitamin D can be a helpful tool. So as always, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for hitting that like button. Thank you for commenting, and we will catch you on a future video down the road.